Hey guys, this video is on units, density, and temperature. So we'll start with units. And this table here um, gives you the SI units that we use, some common ones anyway. Um, so the SI unit of length is the meter, uh, symbol is M, little m. And there are some other commonly used units uh, of length in chemistry here. So an angstrom with this symbol right here is 1 times 10 to the minus 10th meters, and a micron, 1 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. The SI unit of volume is the meter cubed. Um, we also use liters quite a bit, which is one decimeter cubed or one times 10 to the minus three meters cubed. SI unit of mass is the kilogram, kg, both lowercase. By the way, case is important in all these. Um, and we, we more commonly use a gram in chemistry, which is one times 10 to the minus three kilograms. A metric ton, which we don't see that much in chemistry, is a thousand kilograms. Uh, the SI unit of energy is the joule, capital J is a symbol, and these are some other units of energy that we'll see as we go through the course. We'll run into these in other, other modules, other chapters. Pressure, SI unit is pascals. Likewise, here are some other units that we will see later on in the course. Next, density. So first of all, what is density? Um, the formula is right here. It's the D stands for density, it's equal to M, which is the mass, divided by the volume, capital V. I think one of the things about density is it's what we call an intrinsic property. The density of a substance is the same no matter how much of that substance you have. The density of a cup of water is the same as a swimming pool full of water, as long as they're both at the same temperature. But the two components of density, mass and volume, these are what we call extrinsic. In other words, they do depend upon how much stuff you have. So the more water you have, the greater the mass. The more water you have, the greater the volume. These are the common units that we use for density in chemistry, and these are the SI units. So in chemistry, we'll see grams per milliliter, grams per centimeter cubed, and grams per liter. Usually this one we're dealing with gases. The SI unit is kilograms per meter cubed. It's also going to be useful for us to know the formula for the volume of a few different um, geometric shapes. Uh, the volume of a cubed is the length of a side of that cube, cubed to the third power. The volume of a cylinder is pi times the radius squared times the height or length. And the volume of a sphere is four-thirds pi times the radius cubed. So memorize these volume formulas, the density formula, and the units that we use. So here's a little example to illustrate the use of density. So we are asked to calculate the radius of a sphere of tantalum that has a mass of 59.33 grams, and we're given the density of tantalum, 16.65 grams per milliliter. So the idea is if we can get the volume because of that sphere, because it's a sphere, we're told it's a sphere, if we can get the volume of that sphere of tantalum, then we can use the formula for the volume of a sphere and solve for r, the radius, which is what we want. The way we get the volume is because we're given the density and the mass, we can rearrange the density formula right here, solve for volume, and then plug in the mass and the density that will give us the volume, then solve this for radius. So here we go. The volume is the mass over the density. Notice how the units of grams cancel, right? And we end up, we end up with milliliters for the unit. But remember, a milliliter is exactly the same as a centimeter cubed, and it's going to be easier for us to write as centimeters cubed because we're going to end up taking the cube root. So now we have the volume of that sphere in cubic centimeters. Now we use the volume of a sphere formula, formula, solve for the radius, which is this here, three times the volume of a four pi cube root. Plug in three, our volume we just got up there, four pi. Multiply it out, divide, take the cube root, and we get the, the result, 0.9475 centimeters, and we have the radius of the sphere. And the last thing we're going to talk about, guys, is temperature. So what is temperature? It's a measure of the amount of thermal energy an object possesses. Now it ends up, and we're going to see this as we go through this course a couple different places, but it doesn't matter what phase of matter uh, an object is in, solid, liquid, gas, or something else, the atoms or the molecules that make up that object are in con they're constantly moving, either just vibrating about a point or actually moving around translationally. And because they're moving and they have mass, they have kinetic energy. And there's a distribution. We'll see all this in later, uh, maybe later material. But there's it ends up there's a distribution of kinetic energy amongst the particles of that substance, solid, liquid, gas, or whatever. 
but they have some average kinetic energy and the temperature of that, that object is directly related to the average kinetic energy of those particles. And so when we measure the temperature of something, we stick a thermometer in it, we're measuring really the average kinetic energy of those particles. We're going to use three different scales in, in this course, Kelvin, degrees Celsius, and degrees Fahrenheit. And they're related by um, two different points, the freezing point of water and the boiling point of water at one atmosphere pressure. So if we look at the Kelvin scale, the left thermometer here, water freezes at, well, really 273.15 Kelvin and boils at 373.15 Kelvin. In Celsius, water freezes at zero Celsius, boils at 100 Celsius. In Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Fahrenheit it freezes at, and 212 degrees Fahrenheit it boils. So to get the relation between these different scales, we need to look at, at these, um, these points here. So if we look at Fahrenheit, between the freezing point of water and the boiling point of water, there are 180 degrees Fahrenheit, 212 minus 32. In the Celsius scale, there's 100, 100 degrees Celsius, and there's also 100 Kelvins between, between the freezing point of water and the boiling point of water. Oh, by the way, that brings up a point. Um, when we talk about the Kelvin scale, we call, them, we call the, the unit of temperature just Kelvin. We don't say degrees. For Celsius, we say degrees Celsius and degrees Fahrenheit. So <clears throat> because there's 180 degrees Fahrenheit over the same range as there are 100 degrees Celsius or Kelvin, that means that a degrees Fahrenheit is smaller than a degrees Celsius or a Kelvin. And so to relate the, the two different scales, we're going to take, have to take that into account. And the way we do it is we say, okay, between the freezing point and boiling point of water, there are 100 degrees Fahrenheit and 100 degrees Celsius. In other words, there are 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit for every 1 degree Celsius. And so if we want to convert, say, from Celsius to Fahrenheit, we're going to have to take that temperature um, in Celsius and scale it, multiply it by 1.8. And these equations over here are, are giving you the formulas, and that's why where this 1.8 comes from. There's 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit for every 1 degree Celsius. So if we have the temperature in degrees Celsius, we multiply it by 1.8. But we also have to have scale it because um, when it's the temperature is 0 Celsius uh, in Fahrenheit, it should be 32. So if we put 0 in here, we have to add 32 to this to get the correct temperature in Fahrenheit. And this, that's where we get these numbers from in this relationship between Celsius and Fahrenheit. To go the other way, if we know the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit, just do a little bit of algebra, rearrange this, and plug into here. Now to relate Kelvins and degrees Celsius, because they have the same size, there's 100 degrees Celsius for 100 Kelvin, all we have to do is um, shift the scale. So at, at 0 Celsius, it should read 273.15 Kelvin. So we just add 273.15 to the temperature in degrees Celsius, and that'll give us the temperature in Kelvin. And that's all there is to it.